Saba Kidwai, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm really excited because I think like back in the day, you remember the year one podcast? Like, had we even met in person yet at that oh, point? That's a really good question. I'm sure we did. Yeah. But so Can't that remember. was almost eight years ago now. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. That was almost eight years ago when we did that podcast. Wow. And that was one of maybe three or four that we've done since then. Um, ever since, you know, ever since we met, you've been one of the most like intelligent and like, like inspiring people that, I, that I've met. So I'm excited about that. And it's exciting from you've, you've seen me in like every phase of my career. Um, and even in my personal life now between meeting Alexa and like now my, my child and everything. So there's a lot of reasons why I'm really excited to talk to you. And one of those reasons, because I've never asked you, what were you like in high school? Oh, well, I definitely, I've got to say, since you mentioned your son, like the cutest little nose and thighs. <laughs> Just the cutest, cutest, They're cutest. They're getting thicker. <laughs> <laughs> so adorable. What was I like in high school? Everything that I am not right now. <laughs> I was the complete opposite. It was like a total... I was probably like my parents like worst nightmare never did anything like drugs or alcohol or anything like that but definitely like was just very was very angry to be honest if I had to put it in a word I would say I was just very angry and I think that that really infiltrated every single area of both like my personal life school life home life family life friends life like every single area and it was really because I never really successfully made the transition we moved from London when I was 10 so that was fifth grade so fast forward like what four or five years later I just never really found that comfort again that I had had growing up I never found school to be enjoyable and school is such a large part of your mm. day and it, it, and so, yeah, there was this anger. Like, why was there this change? Why did we have to move? Why am I here? Why do I have to do this? Just a lot of anger, like I said, if I had to put it in one word. And it wasn't until I took the high school exit exam. And I was a good student, by the way. Like, I was in AP, IB classes. Like, I didn't live in um, – I went to Ocean View High School. So I didn't live in Huntington Beach. I lived in um, Fountain Valley. But Ocean View and Huntington Beach was one of the only, like, places that had an IB program. So I, was, so I went there. So I was a really good student. But I just I just hated school. It was boring. It was, like, miserable. And so <laughs> yeah, it was. Same. I, I, I have a similar sentiment. <laughs> it was completely boring. So I took the high school exit exam, and I went to Orange Coast College. Mm. And that is probably, like, that was my turning point. Like, the joy that it returned, mostly because of the autonomy that I got again yeah. over, like, learning, being able to create my own schedule, being able to do all of those things, completely brought joy back into my life because I love learning the I, I think the the irony of the fact that like you hated school so much and then you got your PhD <laughs> like <laughs> how does this how does that work I think a really big part of it and it's very subconscious it's only looking back now what like maybe 20 years later that I can say probably a like 95% of what I do is to prevent anyone else from going through what I went through. Mm. Everything I do is geared around how do you lean into people's interests? How do we lean into kids' strengths? Not even kids, even as adults, I'm constantly like, you know, like, hey, like, what do you get out? What are your strengths? Like, what are your interests? Like, what, what motivates you? What energizes you in life? And how do we create more of that? And how do we help people live in that space? Yeah. As long as I've known you, that's been something that you've been really interested in. Um, one of the first projects that we did together, I think, was, well, outside of me actually managing your personal brand now six or seven years ago, which is crazy to think about, you also uh, launched courses around like digital portfolios. And also, per you, you called it a dis digital portfolio in some cases. I mean, it's basically a personal brand, but primarily focusing on LinkedIn. Um, how does like creating that digital that digital portfolio that personal brand? How does that lean into like your interests your passions and then like furthering people's education and career? I feel like our relationship is a really good example of that like people that you never would have known existed So I always say a portfolio LinkedIn profile personal brand anything you want to call it is like a relationship building tool And it allows you to meet people you otherwise never would have known of but what are people coming together around a shared purpose a mm. shared passion a shared vision We we are definitely by no means the same right like we're in totally different industries But we have so many areas that intersect that allow us to like both like learn from each other and continue growing and be mentors to each other thought partners to mm. each other and I find that you don't always find that in your circle of friends. And so it wasn't really until I went into that online space that I started meeting people who not only challenged my thinking, but really helped me see parts of myself. And even if I knew those parts of myself existed, really helped me channel that energy, channel the skills 
into areas that I was not familiar with at all. Yeah. So you've been doing a lot since we met, you know, uh, are we allowed to talk about the tech company you worked at? Yeah, of course. Okay, great. So (laughs) you weren't working, you got your job at Apple. You credit the personal branding thing, which is sweet. Absolutely. Which is awesome. I'm going to take a lot of credit for that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but then now you're working at Wix, which is great. You know, can we talk a little bit about your path there? And like, I, I, I wouldn't say that you were unhappy when we met in your career, but you were definitely like itching for something more. You know what I mean? I'd love to like talk about that breakthrough and the stages of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest thing that I was itching for, and I think this is just like a theme throughout my life, is autonomy. Mm. I think I need autonomy and I need to be able to express myself and just I need to be able to be who I am. I can't like it's very hard for me to fit in a box, Mm. like read somebody else's script and do things like that. And it's really interesting because when I was at Apple, I always say the kinds of people that we wanted to get in front of or the kinds of people that like, you know, we wanted to work with would never even talk to me. And now here I am, my own company working with them. Mm. And so it's been really interesting to see how sometimes like how important it is to be your authentic self yeah yeah and I don't want to butcher like what you're doing today but a lot of your focus is integrating technologies into the educational system is that right yeah well where is it lacking right now and your from your perspective like where is the technology lacking? Mm-hmm. I don't think I wouldn't say the technology is lacking. In fact, I would say if anything, like our like our schools and probably even companies are overflowing with technology. Oh, okay, okay. It's the how we're integrating them. Mm. So it's almost like we're taking like it's almost like giving a bunch of like technology to people in like the 1950s. Mm. Instead of really thinking about, okay, wow, we have this technology, what can we do now that we didn't enjoy doing before that now we have the opportunity to do so we're like still very stuck in these like very industrial systems Mm. and i actually really love this like one line seth godin came out with a new book i think just about a month ago i feel like his every book has like influenced like every (laughs) different transition in my career um because it was really linchpin right like what makes you unique how do you go out and do that that made me create a portfolio that like launched that first phase of my career so i feel like his last book is like gonna help me like launch this like second phase now but he said we don't have to be victims of a system that is no longer useful. Mm. And I thought that that was such a powerful line because it's so true. Like we just feel so powerless, like as if we don't have permission to change things. And Steve Jobs actually said something very similar that someone shared with me the other day as well, where it was like, you forget that everything you're doing, your eight hour work day, like every structure you know was just created by some human. Yeah. And it can, you can easily create something else, mm. yet we really struggle to do that. And so really helping people reignite those creative muscles, really helping people think differently about what we could do that's going to better serve us in the world that we live in because we don't live in the 1950s anymore, yeah. the 1900s anymore. Um, that, that's the area that I focus in on. So to the extent of technology in the school system, when I was in school and using technology, we did two things. We learned how to type with a cat. And then we played the Oregon Trail. Oh my God, yeah. Yes. What What are schools doing now with that technology? I think it really varies. Mm. I think, you know, there's a lot of really incredible things happening and I don't feel like those things get enough publicity always. I think where the challenge lies is how do we scale those things so that everybody has access to those kinds of experiences. So I think a lot of, we have a lot of people with like really great visions for what they hope to create. We see, like I said, we've got a lot of technology in schools, especially since after the pandemic. And I think some of the areas where where we find it to be the most exciting is where kids have more choice in mm-hmm. how they're demonstrating their learning and how they're expressing themselves. Because when you, from a young age, really identify like, wow, I had no idea. I was like, you don't know what you don't know. So the more exposure you get to like video, to music, to like, I like speaking more, I like writing more. Mm. And your ability to even also um, merge those different skills. Like it's not like, oh, writing is more important than video or this is more important than that. It's, you know, in today's world, it's like you almost have to learn like what the what the flow is yeah. of the different mediums to be able to get to your desired goal. And so being able to have that exposure and being able to see the different things that they create, I think that's probably like some of the best work that's happening. Mm. So what would you say is your vision for how technology is integrated or, or with, you know, education systems? Yeah, today or tomorrow because of the work that you're doing. Yeah, I think one of the biggest, well, that's such, that is such a big question, <laughs> such a big question. But, I, you know, I always say, like, it's just at the end of the day, like, my, like, if I had to say it in one line, it's that line that, like, innovation begins with empathy, mm. right? Go back. What are people's strengths? What are their skills? What are your goals? What do you want to create? Because what you might want to create here in the United States might be really different than what somebody wants to create and like, 
South Africa versus what somebody might want to create in like, you know, South Korea. And so every single society, especially when we look at like some of the global challenges we have, whether it's around like climate change or like, you know, social justice issues and things like that, every single area is dealing with something so different that being able to really look at like, what are the skills? What are the mindsets that kids need? And not even just kids, like adults as well. Like I think we really neglect adults and like their learning experiences. But then also put the burden on them that like you're going to prepare that next generation, even though we haven't done a lot to prepare you. And I think being able to really just zone in on what do we need as a community and how do we grow? Like what problems are around us that our kids can get involved in? Like there's so many businesses around us. How do we build some partnerships that are going to help kids do more real world projects? Because mm. um, the resources exist, the partnerships exist, like people are excited to do that kind of work. It's more just the strategy. Like how do you make that happen? How do you go from math, English, history, science to something more like that? Yeah. But how do we start to do something like that? I, I mean, from what I re- from what I remember, I was just graded on how well I knew like trig- yeah, trigonometry. Exactly. I don't think I use it at all today either. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then I'm it could be put in a bucket with like failures, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm lucky enough for whatever advantages I have to end me up to put me in a position where I, you know, start an organization or a business of my own. But that's not the same for everybody. So how is that changing? What are you how, What are you doing within those? within the educational system to change that frame of thinking. So I think one of, there's like two things I would like highlight. One is like, you remember the documentary that we came out with last year, right? Public school, like completely shifted the paradigm of like how Mm -hmm. things happen from having teachers collaborate more together to, this is I think a really big one, having students do entrepreneurial style projects. And I think a lot of times when we think about entrepreneurship, it's always like, oh, it's gotta be money or you gotta be older, you gotta make a product. But when you're younger, there's so many skills you learn as a result of engaging in that process that those are really what you need to be successful Mm -hmm. because they'll translate, you'll build them. Um, I think another really big thing, we talk a lot about like what do people need and not enough about what do we need to preserve. And I never thought of that until my niece and nephew. And I'm sure you're going to see this like Santos, or I feel like anyone who has kids will see this, like the skills, especially when we think about AI, like the way my like nephew who's like four can think of stories, the questions he asks, those are things that as adults in the age of AI, you're going to like struggle to learn that are naturally within us. Mm. And school oftentimes, because of its rigidity, takes those away. And so I often say now so much like, even if you just like left my nephew alone, you just let him like be who he was, he'd probably be way more successful than if you kill that imagination, Mm -hmm. his sense of curiosity, the questions he asks, and just his like interest for in life yeah. you know i always say like i'm so fascinated even something like a blender makes him curious and excited like he he wants to know more and i'm just sitting here blending my thing like thinking like it's nothing yeah. and so you're really reminded through their lens uh the importance of just really small things of we notice which again with ai is going to become so important because the one thing ai can't do is the insights and interactions from your real world mm. right that's your job but if you're you know just passing by and like not taking things in you're not aware you're not observing and though that's that insight skill isn't there um i feel like that's like that's how do we preserve that in kids and help nurture that and grow it versus destroy it what would you say is a way that we could preserve that because some because i think that there's a perspective where you know we can any answer we want any store and people are claiming that they're you know creating these decks and these uh these um, what's it called when you write a, like a scripts and uh, screenplays and okay. screenplays using like chat GBT I'm like or any sort of AI in my head I'm like that seems really challenging I think that there was more to it than what you just said uh, but like how do we preserve imagination when it feels like almost imagination can be automated right now Yeah, I definitely don't think imagination can be automated. And I think one of the reasons we feel that way is because our own bar for what imagination is, what curiosity and creativity is, is so low. Like if you're a really creative person or you're just like, for example, like with me, like AI has only been able to like accelerate my ability to put things out Mm -hmm. and like my ability to take my business to a whole new level because of the mundane tasks it can do. Then for me to now be able to focus fully on like so many of the creative aspects and not have to worry about a lot of those mundane tasks has been incredible but it can't get up there and engage an audience right Mm -hmm. it can't get up there and like speak and it definitely can't put ideas and thoughts together right like that's your insight that you're taking in based on your 
you know, interactions with people based on the problems you're seeing, the fears you're seeing, but also the excitement you're feeling and noticing and how you piece and weave those things together. That's your imagination. That's mm. your creativity in being able to get to an outcome, yeah. right? So like also having that goal in mind, like what are you trying to achieve? What's been a barrier for you along the way and how can this help you solve for it to unlock even more levels? Mm. One barrier is solved for great. Now we can like get to that next level and the next level and the next level. So I think like imagination is like the limitless, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to get to higher levels of it is obviously like everyone's dream. But I think when we go back, I always reference Design 39 because it's such a tangible example people can go back to. But because the teachers changed the way in which they work. So like me and you both had teachers. They taught by themselves. They came every day, 50 minutes. At Design 39, one of the first things they changed was having teachers work together. Mm. So instead of one teacher having to do everything, they were coming like together through their strengths. And so because they were also meeting every single morning, they were able to kind of check in and be like, oh my God, we were going to do this today, but did you hear what those kids were talking about yesterday? Or did you see how they excited they were about this particular topic? Let's go deeper with that. Let's change this here. And so because they're using that design thinking method and they're like iterating and taking these small steps towards what they're designing, it gives them more flexibility mm. versus, it, you know, when I worked at USC, it was like, here's our, you know, syllabus for the entire semester. This is every single lecture we're going to do. And there's like I was like whoa well, what are you gonna do if in week six we want to change something <laughs> oh no we can't and so there's like obviously a little bit of room for flexibility but that rigidity again that we have really prevents mm. imagination prevents creativity and prevents your focus even being on listening even to what are people interested in what are they saying what are they talking about because we're just delivering this very like rote type of experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how are you how are you using it, it, it's so funny. Sometimes I'm just like, how are you using AI? Because I feel like that's such yeah. a good question. But how are you using AI to stay in your in a creative zone for yourself? You know, I'm sure there's a lot of different tasks, but I think for a lot of people, it's maybe a, a daunting subject. Like they hear artificial intelligence, like, okay, I know it exists. I accept that it exists, but it, I, I don't need it in my life. You know, and I, I use it to a certain extent with certain things. And I'm like, actually, I really needed it to do this. Like whether even if it's just like creating a spreadsheet for me because I can't live in yeah. that. You know what I mean? How are you using it to stay in um, more creative spaces for yourself? I think in terms of how I'm using it, I think it's really helped me in a lot of areas that I'm not that strong at. So coming up with the perfect title for something, mm. being able to organize like an outline in the perfect way that it should be. I also really like using it for like, okay, what am I missing? Like, here's the outline that I have. What am I missing? How could this be better? What can I improve? How can this be a better flow for the person who knows nothing about this topic? Mm. Because that's a really big barrier for me. When you're so deep into a topic, you sometimes really, you have such a hard time even identifying how would somebody who knows nothing about this need to get to where you are. And so that tool is amazing wow. at helping you identify the gaps in your thinking and how you can make something much smoother and flow much better it's also really good at like very mundane things like what are outcomes for this and I've got to do that all the time with proposals and this and that's so like I know what the outcomes are that I want but I might not know how to word it in the exact way that it needs mm. to be worded those things even though they seem small take up time and so I'm really big on time so one of my favorite activities to do with people is um just what, what is the schedule of your day how are you spending and I don't know if you saw this article but Shopify added this thing to the calendar when every time you schedule a meeting it adds a dollar amount so that you know oh. this is how much money is being put towards this time that you've allocated for this meeting. And so what they said was like they just did it a few months ago, but so far like from their data or whatever, they've said that the amount of time spent in meetings has decreased 14%, but project completion has gone up 18%. Mm. And so that's one of the first activities we do. And it's so, these are things that again, like seem small, but we just couldn't do before where it's like, okay, I'm just going to pull up a Google sheet. Here's Monday. Here's the tasks I'm doing. This is how much time I'm spending. And then we ask people as well, was the task energizing for you or draining? Mm. And what would you have rather been doing? So if I'm spending two and a half hours a day on emails, and I find that to be really draining. And during that time, I would much rather have been having like one-on-ones with teachers or being able to do like, you know, classroom visits just to say hi to people. That is a huge opening for me to be like, how do I leverage this tool to turn my two hours of email time into one hour of email time? Mm. Even if you're able to save 60 minutes a day, right? Yeah. That's 300 minutes 
a week to open up. And what is the number one excuse people will say when they have these things they want to do but feel they can't? Time. Yeah. It's everyone's biggest barrier to everything. And so the fact that you can just like fill in a spreadsheet, upload it to ChatGPT and get this pie chart. I tell people, imagine if every single person came to your next team meeting with that pie chart. Mm. If you're looking at everyone's uh, charts and like 60% of tasks people are doing are draining them, that's a conversation to be had that's like health and wellness, right? How can you, if these tasks are draining you, how might AI be able to help? And then the tool can give you suggestions. <laughs> and that's another really interesting thing we see is that most people think that like, oh, it's going to do the work for you because it's giving you these ideas. It's so interesting how once you see an idea on the screen, you don't even want that idea, but mm -hmm. you have a floodgate of ideas now yeah. that are rushing through your head. I find that fascinating. Yeah. These ideas that were not there 10 seconds ago, now all of a sudden just popped up in your head because you saw something. So there's a lot of really interesting things that's reigniting more than perhaps taking away if you know how to use it yeah you've talked a little bit about actually i take that back you've talked a lot about how to use these tools because i think you know i i don't even want to speak for the majority of people a lot of times i find myself just uh using it as like a better form of google basically um and whether it's getting facts or more context on facts or things like this i have used it in other uh in other contexts to, you know, create presentations, help me fill in gaps. I think I told you this as well. But one of the things you talk about a lot is like the framework and, and how you're prompting ChatGPT to use it. Uh, I know it's a really broad question, but can you give us an example of like a crappy like prompt and then one that could actually produce a, a result that's usable? Yeah, absolutely. So let's take something that like me and you kind of both have in common. That's like blogging, writing, mm -hmm. maybe even yeah, like, you know, I want to transcribe this podcast, turn it into an article and put it up. So a lot of people's like first kind of gut reaction just because of how we're trained to use technology is we do treat it like Google, right? So you might go in there and be like, write an article about using AI in education. And it will absolutely create something for you. I think that's one of the, the kind of bad things as well. Like it will give you something that you think looks great just because it can. It's not going to be like, well, that's not really enough information for me. Yeah. Sometimes it will. Um, I have found lately more and more sometimes it will kind of be like, well, tell me more. But it's not its default by any means. But if you went in and you said, so we call it Spark, right? And we, we called it Spark because we kept saying like, oh, Spark ideas, Spark this, Spark that. So we call this being able to do this skill your human Spark. It can't generate something by itself. It needs you to put that input in, mm. at least for right now. <laughs> so we say, talk about your situation. Okay, so I'm a teacher. I work in Orange County. And, you know, we're working with schools to you know change the way we do things because we are in such an outdated system but the problem is most people don't even know what AI is they've never used AI so we're going through a lot of context I kind of say as if you were like venting about something over coffee with your friend mm. and you're like oh my god I can't believe this is like the problem that I have this is what's going on you're just like giving all these little details about the good the bad the problem but also what you want so in that case, instead of just saying like, write me an article on AI and education, you would talk about your situation. That's the S. You would be like, this is my role. This is who I am. This is my business. This is what I want. And here's the problem, mm. right? Like I need something really basic that somebody who knows nothing about this topic is going to be able to like, you know, take this understand and have two takeaways that they can immediately implement. Um, your aspiration, like why do you even care about this? Like what's your dream outcome? My dream is that people like read this article and they're like, oh my God, this can change everything about what I do. I want to go in and learn more what results are you looking for I want 85 percent of people to read this article and feel confident that they could go and try this activity that we're sharing with them and then we put that in and we get the results mm. and then we kind of iterate it back and forth a little bit and then we do the last one which is my favorite which is kismet that's the spark and that's basically designed to mimic that serendipitous human conversation mm -hmm. so for example like you know you're with two people you're sharing an idea and somebody's like oh really well like what about this and you're like oh my god i never thought about that so we asked chad gpt like hey like what have i not thought of like what have i not considered mm -hmm. what can make this better now that you know all of this information and it gives you i find incredible results and that's constantly a skill you're refining mm -hmm. like that spark method isn't even something like sure you can use it as a prompt in chad gpt but we use it because we find so many people like when we're like, okay, well, why do you want this from ChatGPT? Like, why are you trying to create this lesson? Why are you trying to create this email? They have no answer. Mm. So we don't even know why we do half of the things we do. We're just running on like auto. And so Spark really prompts you like, why do you care about this? Why does this matter to you? What results do you want from this? So it's not just, 
I want a lesson plan for teaching math. It's I want my kids to feel more confident in math. And mm. those outputs that it gives are night and day once really? it has that information. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like when you do just give me a lesson plan on fractions for fifth grade, it will be like, okay, here's some worksheets. Here's some this. When you add in, I want my kids to feel confident. They don't like math. They find it boring. Now, all of a sudden, it's putting in scavenger hunts and all these different things. And even when you see an idea like a scavenger hunt, so for example, you could see something like that on Google if you were searching lesson plans. But the fact that this can do the work for you, mm. and Google, that's where it ends. You've got a result, great, you're on your own now. <laughs> but with this tool, it's like a scavenger hunt, tell me more, can you build it for me? Can you do this, can you do that? So it can keep going. So the mm. idea that like, you know, many people say it's like your assistant and stuff like that, it's like your thought partner. It can like do stuff for you yeah. that moves the needle. Uh, I'm always really interested in, this is completely uh, off topic and I apologize. I'm always really interested in, uh, not alliterations, acronyms. Oh, so Spark. Oh, yes. Did you come up with the Spark acronym before or after? Like, how did that fit? Because I think it, it's just incredible yeah. how that fits. No, and that's another. So we kept saying Spark, Spark, Spark. And so it was like a partnership, to be honest, with ChatGPT. I was like, hey, like, I'm building this course. Um, I need a framework. Um, it's also really good at creating those, like organizing things for you in a way that would take a human like days and months, if mm -hmm. even ever. And so we said like, hey, these are the areas, but I didn't have it laid out as spark. It was like situation, um, obstacle instead of problem. Mm. And then I had some other things and I was like, but I want people to like see this and like see how it can spark ideas and how it can do this. And somewhere in the midst of all of my nonsense that I was typing Were you just in. just having a conversation oh, with absolutely. It? Yeah, Jeez. I'm telling it like, hey, That's this fun. is what I want people to do. This is how I want people to treat it. This is what I'm trying to create. This is what I'm trying to do. So the ideas and the imagination, those are all mine. It can't generate that. But can it turn it into something that's more actionable for others? Absolutely. And mm. so that's what I say. It's the gap between idea and execution. You can have amazing ideas, but that strategy on being able to execute them in the way that your audience needs them, that's hard. And this tool knows how to do a lot of that. Yeah. And if it obviously can't do it with 100% perfection, it needs you along the way. But once it gives you that initial thing, honestly, I find that you're like 80% of the way there yeah. and the rest you know how to do. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes, as you mentioned, it's like it'll spit out a couple ideas and that sparks, you know, your own frame of thinking because you're thinking in one lane and it'll take you out yeah, of it sometimes. Exactly. And I think that's helpful. I've, I've asked it multiple times when I'm just like in a, in, a, in a slump of like, hey, can you give me like five, you know, activation yeah. ideas for this and I'll do it. I don't use any of those, but now I'm thinking in a different mindset because it st sparked it. Yeah. You know, so I think that it is really interesting to see that happen. This is kind of a loaded question and maybe obvious, but this is, do you feel like this is something everybody needs to learn how to use? I do. And, you know, I feel like me and you talk about this all the time, but there is such a gap between people who know how to leverage technology. And it sounds so cliche to like design their life mm. versus people who are stuck doing things the way they think they need to be done. Mm. And I feel like that is one of the biggest barriers that we need to break. Like every single person should have access to that. And when we, I mean, we were just talking about this earlier, when we used to think about access to opportunity prior to a lot of technology, it was where you lived, who you knew, where you were growing up. Mm. Today with the internet, people who have nothing are able and it actually is a lot of people who come from adversity who come from like you know like challenging circumstances channel that into building these incredible opportunities for themselves and so how do we democratize that how do we teach that from a younger age that I think is something that is so important because otherwise we're just going to see a larger and larger not even income disparity but I think happiness disparity, mm. which I think is a bigger problem. I actually think a lot of our political problems we have today are because some people, like a lot of people can't understand why the world is changing and other people are able to live a certain way and they're not. Mm. And that causes, I think, a level of tension in society that just is very, very hard to recover from. Yeah. So you feel as if this can open up maybe like new lifestyles and new frames of living for people. Yeah. I and mean, that doesn't you, always right? mean more income, right? Yeah, right? It doesn't have to mean more. Oh yeah, absolutely for me it has. <laughs> and not only has it done that for me, but it constantly motivates me to be more aligned, more self-aware. What makes me happy? What do I want? Yeah. Right? What would I choose? Would I choose A or would I choose B? 
So like one of the thing I think like the biggest motivations for me is like even just being able to spend time with my niece and my nephew. Like I will say no to a meeting or to like a workshop or to like something if like it means that like there's something else I would rather be doing with mm. them. So even like we talk about how we want more of these things, family, health, wellness, friends, and we know that those are things that contribute to like good health, low stress, longer lives. Um, but we don't design society or help people actually build that and figure out, okay, how do you get it? It's one thing to want it. We all want it, but not enough people know the strategy. And that's why like I value our friendship so much. Like I learn so much from you. I'm always like, I don't know how to do this. I'll never forget where I was like, I don't know how to do business. And you're like, you don't know how to do it yet. Mm. And that's like one of the most powerful design thinking <laughs> strategies, which like, again, when it's your own self, it's yeah. hard sometimes to be in that. So having people around you who can support you, who you can learn from, even just sitting here and being in your office and like watching like how much you've grown over the years is like motivation for like, wow, like anything is possible for anyone. And so how do we, but there's strategy behind it. It doesn't happen by magic. Yeah. So. Yeah. It is kind of interesting. It's hard for me to uh, take those compliments. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Very well deserved. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I do think it's interesting. We started with like, you know, the personal branding and the uh, designing like digital portfolios. And obviously for, you know, for myself, like that's kind of what I built Blue Light off of the back of was a personal brand and, you know, and talking about like a certain topic for a long time. I've, I've since wanted to change that just because I'm kind of over talking about like Instagram algorithms and things like this. Um, there are a ton of things that, that, um, that interest me. And I'm curious, you know, the, I'm curious for you, like as you're creating, you know, content, reaching new people, things like this, what have been some of your strategies? This is a little different than the AI talk, but this is, what are some of your strategies in integrating like your personality into topics such as like education and, and uh, artificial intelligence and things like this. Like, how do you do that? Because I think you do it really well. Oh, thank you. But you know what I want to say before that, because it ties back to what you were saying, your ability to t make that transition now comes because of all the practice you've had. Oh, thank you. Whereas I think it's, but it goes for anybody though, right? Like it's really, and that's why I go back to kids because the younger you teach people that, the more confidence you develop in speaking and the more you're like, I want to talk about this, so I'm going to. Mm -hmm. We don't realize that's actually a really rare skill. Mm. right not everybody gets up and says I want to talk about this now and so that's what I'm going to do and I'm going to go create videos <laughs> on this and I'm going to go talk about this because we're when you're on social media you think the whole world is doing it but they're not mm. and so that's a really rare skill that like not everyone has and so the making that transition comes from the other things which is going to tie into my answer and that is I can't even tell you how many times I mean just recently like one of my like really 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 good friends was like your videos are cringe she's just like I cannot record like that she's like it's cringe I can't record like that. And so it was honestly because I've seen the results. And this is another thing that I think is so important when you're trying anything new is you've got to remember how you did something and something positive that happened. I mean, obviously, you should look at the flip side of that, too. So you don't repeat mistakes. But we focus a lot on like, let me look at my failures. We don't focus enough on like, I did this. And wow, this is what happened as a result. So I'm going to keep doing more of this mm. and have that confidence. So today, I mean, one of the reasons I tell that story is because like literally just last week, because of a video, I closed my biggest contract to date I love that. and here is the number one reason why I think video and personality is so important is I noticed this so much in the consulting space it's about trust I mean honestly it's about trust in every single area but people I've noticed do not go online and do a bunch of research about like who's the best person I should talk to and let me look at the lot like these five candidates and now let me drill into mm. these ones no people are like I like that person they talk about this so I'm going to hire them. Yeah. I have seen that happen and it can ha be good or it can be bad. <laughs> like but that, that is how I see so many people operate. Or one person recommends you and now this happens to me a lot and now that person is curious about who they who you are. So they'll go online, but if you've got a video, it's almost like they're meeting you in person. Yeah. And that translation into okay, yes is so much faster at least for me than any other medium mm -hmm. I put out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I want to like kind of unpack like the video thing. So you're saying that the video was, or you closed this, one of your biggest deals because of this video. Was it just a video that was on like Instagram? It, I think they saw it on Facebook, but yeah. they were like, wow, your videos really made me think. Yeah. And just eliciting that feeling made you feel like I'm somebody who you'll learn from and you yeah. will. And so, but it goes to show like that is the power of video. So as uncomfortable as it might feel, it's definitely not, 
the norm I would say in like my like area or field sure. to create the kinds of videos that I create sometimes but I do think having person and I think it also depends I always say this I say this to like people that I teach personal branding to as well if people don't like watching you on video or they don't like your style you're probably not going to enjoy working with them yeah so when I'm thinking about like change and things like that if you're somebody who's like why are you creating those videos chances are we're gonna have a really hard time aligning and there's gonna be a lot of pre-work that needs to right, be done before right. we can even get to something else so yeah. it's also like who do you want to work with what brings you joy like again going back to like what type of work energizes you you don't always get to choose but the goal is to get to a place yeah. where you do I you know I'd like to say that when I do see those videos sometimes I don't always watch it with the sound on just because mm. I just don't but I'm always like kind of pumped just because I was there when the personal branding journey started yeah and now like you've kind of flown with yeah. it which is pretty tight um I love seeing that uh that progression and then seeing like all of the things that it's done for you I'm not gonna lie sometimes when I publish my own videos I cringe at myself I, I can't, I actually can't stand it, especially like the talking head ones, but I'm like, yeah, should I do this? This format's a little bit better because it's conversational. I'm not by myself, like trying to preach to people. You know what I mean? I don't think I ever have. Have you ever had a, have you ever had a moment where you publish something? It's like, I know that I should do this, but I don't really like it, but I'm doing it anyway. I think sometimes what I get frustrated by is not so much like the publishing of a video. If I'm ever publishing a video, I love what I'm putting out. So I'm like happy with nice. it. But what I don't like is sometimes being forced into creating something in a certain way. Mm. And I think that's the like Instagram thing that they've created. I feel like on TikTok, yes, there's the trending things and whatnot, but there's still so much room for your own personality mm. on LinkedIn. So much room for your own personality. Whereas Instagram, it's almost like they tried to, like they really force you into a certain box to be able to. And I don't like that twofold one. Like, you know, my biggest realization when threads happen because so many Instagram people automatically joined, I was like, wow, I had no idea you knew any of this. Yeah. I had no idea. I, I felt awful <laughs> saying it, but my number one reaction to most people was I had no idea how smart you were. Yes. Because Instagram forces you to talk in a certain way, act in mm. a certain way, share information in a certain way. But threads, watching people's personalities come out, I am now 10 times more interested in you from three lines than I was from so many other things. Yeah, because, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Like, you're on Instagram, they kind of, you're forced to fall in, in love or to follow somebody based off of somebody's image nine times out of 10. And even when they're pr doing videos, it's like, I just told you, like, your video is off. Uh, with something like Threads or Twitter, I always love Twitter the most. I prefer writing over most things. Yeah. And so seeing somebody's thought process or seeing their wit and fo yeah. for forced to f being forced to focus on that is something I think that is really interesting. I can't say that I've been really, like, impressed with anybody's. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're just saying the same thing that was over here. But okay, cool. Like, I, I would love to see kind of like a difference in the personality between platforms, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, I don't know. I, there's a part of me that's like, we're, we're so focused on like, there's a, there's a certain community of people that are so focused on the personal brand. It's like, when are you going to let the shtick down? Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I think that brings me kind of to my next question is, you know, and not actually my question. It was a question from the internet that I asked yesterday with like AI, you know, you talked about preserving imagination um through it and as it becomes more integrated into our lives how do we like continue to stay human like do you do you do you feel like we're giving any of this up i mean there i i still believe that there's maybe like a certain segment of people who are really creative and can create these frameworks but how like what does it what does it make obsolete you know what I mean? There are, there has to be some things that it makes obsolete. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's not even so much like we should never position it like um, only creative people can use this or you have to be because even our definitions of creativity are so confined. Mm. But I think, you know, one of the best books, I'm definitely like, I, this is the book that I recommend to people. It's, um, oh, it's called S Superpowers. God, I don't remember the name. It's written by Kai Fu Lee. He's, he's got two really big, big books. Should I ask? AI superpowers, uh, I think okay. is what it's called. Yeah, maybe link it in your show notes. We'll yeah. find the exact link for people. But I, I want to say it's called AI superpowers. And it was written a while ago, maybe like 2016, maybe like 2017-ish. But one of the things that he talks about in there 
was the importance of building a society or the possibility of building a society based on love and compassion. And it seems like such a far-fetched concept. Like, And he actually says like those are the jobs that will be prioritized. A mom staying home with their child, mm. a parent, ta- a, a child taking care of their parent. Like all of these different, very, very, very uniquely human things that we all do, but maybe we don't have enough time for or whatnot. Even just the act of being able to spend more time with friends and family, more community service type work and things like that, those are basically what he kind of says are like things that should be paid for in the future, whereas now like none of that is paid for, right? We So again, one of the hardest things for us to do right now is not so much look at like, okay, like if we try to recreate or leverage these tools within our existing structures, we're going to fail. It, right. It's We're not designed for that. You can't have like, okay, nine to five, everyone still has to work this way. If you're f- eight hour tasks can now be done in three hours. Well, what happens to the rest of the five hours? Are you just gonna drive people more crazy? Like, how are you gonna, how are we creating a society where it's okay to give people back that time Mm. without reducing profit? And I think that's where countries are going to look really different because if you think of, for example, like in London, like people automatically have six weeks of vacation. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like vacation over there in Europe in general is so much more generous than it is here. Whereas in the United States, most some most people don't even have two weeks vacation, right? Most people yeah. don't even get maternity leave yeah. here. So those values that we hold as a society are about to pay a really big role in our evolution of these things. Whereas countries that already value those things, Finland, for example, has been looking at AI and has been preparing their citizens since like pre 2020 Mm. and so countries like that that already value those things are going to have a much smoother transition because their identity isn't tied to their job Mm. in the united states our identity is our job and that's it sure you might be other things but they're all secondary but here and one of the reasons is if you don't have a job you don't have health care you don't have so many other things whereas it's not like that everywhere and that's not to say that one place is better than the other it's just what we have to look at things holistically like that to be able to think about okay what how do we create conversations about what we value yeah. and how do you elect people that share those values so that they will advocate for those things and create those things if we keep electing people that don't talk about that even don't know what ai is because like you know they're like 10 generations above us then it's really hard to begin moving things in that direction yeah that's interesting when you were starting to create your you know create your your future and create your career because that's essentially what you did what are some of the values that you put in place when you started creating that completely different i know but i think this is a topic that's come up on on a couple different uh, interviews recently is like i was tired of what i was doing and tired of this system what are the values you put in place that you wanted to focus on and, and amplify in your career I think this will take us full circle back to the beginning of that like anger. But I think one of the things I always knew growing up, I just could never articulate it. I never knew what it was. I always knew I was capable of more. Mm. And I felt like I wasn't in a space that was allowing me to reach my full potential. And I always say, I was actually having this conversation with my friend the other day because we both moved to like this one school that we went to in fifth grade, which was like, like, I feel like one of the worst things ever. But we both happened to have made the move in fifth grade. And we both talked about how like, wow, it took us so much longer in life to get to where we are. And I still don't feel like we both were kind of just like yeah we still don't feel like we really reached our full potential and we talked about how like wow there's so many other people that are doing all these amazing things but we didn't grow up with anyone like that we never saw that growing up but the one thing me and her both had in common was our dads were entrepreneurs Mm. and so while we didn't explicitly get those learnings now I like you know when you grow up in an environment where you're moving like our dad we moved from London to California we moved from California to Dubai from Dubai back to California so the idea of moving isn't something so outrageous yeah um, just being able to see our dad like work so hard, have everything, have nothing, and then go back to building that again teaches you again that like, wow, if you're resilient, if you're hardworking, if you're patient, those are the things that will come. But he always talked about like the vision he had for his life. Like, oh, I always want my children to have this or, you know, oh, I always used to think maybe I'll have this. So it teaches you like, oh, if I think I can, I want something, then maybe if I work hard enough, I can actually get it. Doesn't mean you always will, but it takes you down this journey. And so I would say this intersection of like family, freedom, patience and hard work and optimism like you have to believe in yourself Mm. even when it's really hard and that's why lately reflection has been such a key practice for me because Mm. 
every level that you get to like is going to be hard but if you don't remember like I was once there before and I got here so okay if I just work hard enough or I just do this I can get there again if I reach out to the right people if I invest in myself whatever it is that you need to do I think that optimism is really important but at the end of the day freedom like I like my autonomy I think it's just I was born like Mm. that like I want autonomy and I want freedom yeah I love that um Saba you shared so many incredible insights with us and thoughts with us uh i'm gonna ask you one last question but before i do that uh, if somebody wanted to connect with you how can they find you i always say just designing schools.org it's like choose your own adventure <laughs> <laughs> nice so it's just that now just designing schools.org and then if you like instagram go to instagram if you like youtube yeah. go to youtube it's like choose your own adventure go where you'd like to go but designing schools.org is the home base for everything oh, i love that okay well what i'm excited about is like the last question is probably gonna, it might be a long answer and it might it's probably uh, add to more which i'm excited about so since day one you've been referencing seth godin which i'm really uh which i think is great because I, I look up to seth godin for his like marketing and a lot of his leadership thought as well i think is really great um in your documentary last year you had the opportunity to, to, to interview this guy which i think is just incredible can you talk about the path of like what it was to first read a book idolize is a strong word but definitely i don't know what would you call that uh let's just call it idolize because i can't think of another one um his thought process to like booking the meeting and and then just like doing the doing the interview, which turned out really, really great. What was that path like and what did it share with you about like the people that you might have access to because of the internet? So I'll share the path by sharing the email that I sent to him. So I basically sent him an email saying, this email to you was a decade in the making. Mm. And I read, had read his book about what, 2012? And it completely changed my life because I had grown up, like I said, you know, very traditional, tr- good school, good grades, all the things. But when I graduated, I it was just a few months later, it was the recession. And I just feel like everything changed. And I honestly had a really, really hard time getting a job. I got great evaluations. I was good at what I did. Mm-hmm. But that idea that he had in linchpin which was it's no longer enough to just be good at what you do you have to really be able to identify what your what makes you unique in that circle of good and how can you articulate and show that to someone else Mm -hmm. and so i was like oh wow okay well then this is the one thing i'm really good at and here's my portfolio i'm going to show it and before then it was like you know those like binders with like the plastic covers where you put papers inside that's what i had before so i had like examples from my kids and the projects they'd done examples of a lesson plan and how i created things examples of like presentations i used to do and it was like this like folder i would take with me and so but it worked because i was able to articulate like hey i'm really good at integrating technology and i'm really good at um literacy is obviously a huge problem like you know in the united states but i was really good and we think literacy is only for elementary it's like kids after third grade if they're not taught how to read you like never recover it's like really hard so i was really good at integrating literacy into Mm how we taught history and so I used to talk about that and so that was the one area I was a good history teacher but what makes you unique that was the one thing I used to talk about and it worked and then being able to do that that portfolio piece just being able to again lean into what makes me unique and then going down that path it grows because the world keeps changing there's more opportunities for you to showcase that so then I built a website and then you know obviously with you that was the beginning of Instagram and just getting onto other platforms and other places and it just it's a it's a trickle effect and I think the biggest piece of that is it's not just like hey Seth Godin here's an email can I interview you this is a decade in the making but he can click my name and see the evidence Mm. and I think that's the magic I always say like if somebody can click your name and see something within 10 seconds they'll make their decision Mm. and it's most likely going to be yes because you're following through like people can see like okay wow this is somebody who's doing all this stuff or like oh okay they have this going on and he he actually says that as well like I'll talk to you I'll I'll take your interview but I want to see the proof Mm. of consistency Mm. and so it's like also really knowing like why you want to message somebody like being able to understand where they're coming from respecting and i also said i just want 15 minutes of your time Mm. and so gotcha so i mean from a tactical standpoint you're framing the fact that you're not asking for a couple hours excuse me not framing for a couple hours the personal brand i guess yeah i wish there was another way to say that but personal brand is what it is the personal brand that you had built over at least like seven or eight years digitally anyways, uh, was like the evidence that, you know, you're for real. This isn't like, oh, I had this idea and now I want to interview you. 
And then obviously, like you showed a real interest in in him as well, and being pretty direct. Do you remember what the um, subject line was? I don't remember the subject line, but I did divide the email into like the ask. So mm -hmm. I started with the ask. Mm -hmm. This is what I want, and then I did the why. And I labeled it, like I put headings in my email so it was really easy to read, but I sent it at like 11 p.m. at night. I was like, I have nothing to lose. I was like, I can remember exactly where I was like lying down on my sofa, like, okay, I'm going to bed, whatever. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, just yeah. try. And the next morning I woke up and there was, here's my calendar, let's schedule a call. Wow, it, that's so cool. But just so people really recognize the value of a personal brand, when we got on that call and I said, do you have any questions for me? Because like, obviously you don't even know anything about like me or what I do or whatever. He said, your online reputation precedes you. I'm ready, let's go do this. So your online presence is like your ultimate introduction. And mm. if you can put that out, and it doesn't have to be fancy. Like people think it has to be amazing, but I always say because hardly anybody really does it well, even the lowest entry point will get you something. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Um, Saba, thank you so much for this. You're so and, welcome. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. I'm excited to talk more about it, especially as these technologies evolve. You know, there's a plethora of questions. I'm, I'm sure that'll come up uh, to the listener. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. If you love the episode, we would dig a five star review. And if you didn't like it that much, feel free to stick it to us. But subscribe anyway, because we're going to have a ton of incredible people just like Saba Kidwai back on the show. Dr. Saba Kidwai back on the show. Thank you. <laughs>